Yes, from Beijing. Uh, welcome everyone on this I can ask the stage. I think this Friday, you know, online event already become one of your habits. Every Friday you turn on, you know, get on I can ask.com and you listen to all these wonderful talks. We use the technique and science to connect the world and the universe. So today is uh, uh, it's my great honor to be the opening you know, our speakers here, uh, Alice John from Peking University. Uh, we met in last year, one year or more than one year. Uh, but this will be our first time to do something new uh, because this week we have a speaker, Stephen Lecou. Yeah, we have our first time. We want to have our guest moderators. So we change it something. Yeah, my guest uh, moderator here is Professor Jiang Qingyi, is from uh, Southern University of Science and Technology. He is a superstar in China in microfluidics field. So today is her du his duty to do the moderator. So Xinyi, please. Uh, thank you, Alice, for organizing everything. Uh, I'm uh, Xinyi Zhang from the Southern University of Science and Technology, speaking from Shenzhen, which is in Southern China. So it's my great honor to introduce Professor Stephanie Lacour, who is uh, the uh, Bartarelli Foundation Chair in Neuroprosthetic Technology at Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. She is uh, speaking to us from Geneva today. She received her PhD in electrical engineering from INSA de Lyon in France and completed postdoctoral training in Princeton at, and uh, University of Cambridge. She joined EPFL in 2011 and she has been a full professor um, there since 2017. Uh, she is a co-founding member and current director of the EPFL Center for Neuroprosthetics, um, and she is the recipient of MIT TR35 Zanta Award, and she was also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. She has been awarded with a number of very prestigious grants, including ERC grants. So I think I will um, stop here and uh, give the floor to Professor uh, Stephanie LaCour. Now, uh, Professor LaCour, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Professor Jiang, for uh, the kind introduction. Um, and thank you also very much, Alice, for inviting me to uh, uh, for this great opportunity to share uh, the work uh, that we do in the lab. So I'm now sharing the slides, so I hope everybody can see okay. Yes, we can see you. Okay, very good. All right, so um, so first, before I dive into the, the topic, I would like to just uh, have a quick uh, um, introduction on EPFL. So EPFL is located at the heart of, uh, uh, of Europe um, uh, in Switzerland, and we're located right on the uh, Geneva Lake. And EPFL is a rather, uh, it's a, a technological institute um, and it's one of the youngest worldwide. We are only a 52 year old um, uh, institute, but we, we have a very good position in the world ranking. And um, uh, we, we host currently about 16,000 students. We have nearly 400 labs and the research we conduct and the education we conduct at the PFL is really across multiple uh, sciences going from basic sciences and life sciences, but also engineering, computer science, architecture, civil and envir environmental engineering. So we have a very dynamic and, 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 and broad uh, range of activities around engineering and technology at large. And one specificity that we have also is that uh, EPFL is uh, located on five different sites. So the, um, the core of the, of the school is in Lausanne at the heart of the, uh, what is called the uh, Swiss uh, Romand. And then we have also four other sites, and in particular, the one where I am based in Geneva. Uh, and we're located in a special campus called Campus Biotech. And this campus is the home for a lot of the activity we do at the PFL, but also with joint institution on applied neuroscience, neurotechnology, and translation research. And specifically, um, I'm, I'm currently heading our Center for Neuroprosthetics, and uh, we currently are um, um, hosted, we're, the center is hosting 12 professors 
uh, and, and, and group leaders. And our say specialty is really that uh, uh, the, the 12 group members or the 12 PIs here are very much driven through uh, understanding and developing novel technology for neuroscience that go from basic studies all the way to translation of research. So we're very much motivated by bringing innovation and technology to the clinic, to patients, so that we can actually help de develop novel diagnosis and novel um, um, uh, therapeutical uh, approaches for patients who suffer from uh, neurological disorders, so traumatic uh, injuries to the nervous system. So we operate in very, uh, uh, very nice uh, shared facilities where we can go from designing and making structures uh, 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 that are uh, microfabricated. So we have a, what we call a neural microsystem platform. We can conduct a range of preclinical and human neuroscience experiments. We also have gene therapy uh, uh, facilities. And uh, what actually is, is very exciting in our center is that uh, everybody is really collaborative and working together so that we, we have people who come from an engineering background who will interact with neuroscientists and, and clinicians. So that actually through this interdisciplinary approach, we, we believe we can make much faster progress into bringing technology and innovation to, to clinical application. So this being said, I would like to now focus, uh, so give you a little bit uh, of an idea of the type of work we conduct in my lab. And in particular, we focus on soft bioelectronic interfaces. And what we mean by soft bioelectronic interfaces, these are devices that are man-made. So we fabricate them from scratch, but with the objective of uh, providing biointegration or at least a biomimetic design uh, to the biology host that we actually um, uh, be interfaced with those devices. And we have actually, we're following a specific plan when we develop our integrated, uh, uh, our bioelectronic interfaces, which always starts by understanding where we actually want to position our bioelectronic device. And so we have to actually look carefully about the biological host and our particular angle is in defining mechanically where the device is going to be located, how we're going to position the device and how this, the, the host, the, the biological host, what is its mechanical signature? Is it a material that is static? Is it a material that is dynamic? And if so, how can we actually select the, the right properties and the right materials to build the electronic devices? So once we, we have sort of the, uh, the, the specs that we need in terms of uh, mechanical response or mechanical signature for our, uh, our structure, then we select materials and, um, that we can actually, uh, that usually is available from standard microfabrication techniques. So we'll use a lot of, um, technology that are borrowed from the MEMS or from the microelectronic fields. Uh, we work uh, primarily with uh, fin film materials. So we do a lot of what is called fin film electronics and we integrate and combine this with polymers so that we can have actually a little bit of a, a higher uh, scale in terms of the material we are able to, to manipulate and the actual mechanical signature that we want to have for our bioelectronic interface. Then once we know which material and which fabrication technique we want to use, then we fabricate circuits. So circuits for us may, may mean a simple transducer, which is connected to uh, uh, an um, uh, um, outside uh, uh, control unit or instrumentation unit, but it could also mean a system that is more integrated where more electronic components are actually uh, built and integrated into the soft substrate. And uh, we, we need to actually, we always design these circuits so that they are compatible with this 3D mobile and wet environment that uh, the biological host is. Then once we fully characterize the system in vitro, then we move to the next step we, and we implement the soft bioelectronic interfaces in vivo. And there I will show you several of these, uh, of these examples in order to validate whether the design com concept is actually valid and whether the function that the bioelectronic system is supposed to deliver is able to deliver. And ultimately, and this is a, a really not in every, every cases or every project that we have in the lab, but whenever it's possible uh, or where we have uh, a technological innovation that is uh, you know, the most promising or the most advanced, 
Then we're trying to translate any of the findings that we have from the preclinical evaluation towards a human use. And this is, of course, an extremely long-term um, uh, endeavor because uh, before you can validate you know, protocols and use of, uh, uh, of devices made in the lab into a patient, it, this takes many years, but uh, I'll show you uh, some of the framework we're developing in order to accelerate this sort of lab to clinic um, uh, translation of uh, bioelectronic interfaces. And so the work we do in the, in the team is very much focused on what we call wearable and neuroimplantable interfaces. That means that we are primarily developing systems that are either stuck or mounted onto the, the, the human body, or that is implanted into the nervous system and uh, interfacing with the nervous system. So this can be the brain, can be the spinal cord or peripheral nerves, as you, as you see here on the cartoon in, uh, in pink for the, uh, the brain and yellow for the spine, nodal cord, and the peripheral nerves. Uh, but this is the, the type of biological medium we, we're aiming to interface. And so with this, um, this type of consideration, and even for wearable devices, what we, uh, the important metric or characteristics that we account for is the softness of the material. So if you consider wearables, you want to mount the electronic system onto the human skin. Human skin is very soft and compliant. It's also very, a very dynamic environment. As I speak now, you can see I'm moving my, my, my hand, my arms. And so the skin that is covering the, my, my limbs is actually moving and stretching back and forth. Um, so the skin, uh, if you want to position electronics on top of the skin, then you need to be able to ensure that the electronics is not going to impair the, um, the natural movement of the skin. And it's the exact same thing if you want to position an electronic device at the surface of the, of the, the nervous system. Of course, the structure is three-dimensional, so we're not a flat plane. We are 3D, 3D objects, right, 3D structures. So you need to also think about um, these uh, implantable or wearable interfaces that can actually conform, but also um, capture the, uh, the three, three, 3D aspect and structure of the, of the human body. We have multiple scales. I'll come back to that in a moment. And it's also very heterogeneous material uh, because we go from structures that are very rigid and stiff, like the bones, all the way to the softest tissues, which, are, which is our brain. And so then the, the other important aspect, of course, is not only the mechanics, but it's also what are the function and the functionalities that you want to design for, the, uh, for your interface. And you can have interfaces that are either meant to sense, so record information from the, from the human body, from the nervous system, or actually modulate activity, which is more on the actuation side. Or you, you, in between, you also may need some structures that will allow to process some of this information in order to do a closed loop. So you have to actually think of integrating multiple levels of functions and functionalities into your, your bioelectronic interfaces. So I've, I've, I've uh, split the talk in, uh, in two, in three parts. Um, and so now I want to spend some time in uh, sharing with you our approach in, in, in when we start with the design of a novel um, bioelectronic implant. So again, this is all in the context of neural interfaces um, uh, that, uh, that I will uh, present uh, today. Um, and so the first element is really to understand the anatomy and the mechanical dynamics of the biological host. So, so if you uh, are familiar with material science and in particular man-made materials, you will see that a lot of um, the material that we can fabricate, which are examples that I give at the very top of the slide here, are material that can span a very wide range of properties. What I've, I've plotted here is E, that's the Young modulus. This is the elastic modulus of a material. So a very high value for E means a very stiff material. This would typically be steel or silicon. If now you want to go to the other extreme, a very soft material, this would be like jello cubes, which are a 
mostly water-based uh, structures. And there they have extremely low elastic modulus, typically in the kilo or sub-kilopascal range. And in between, you can find, for example, elastomers we, that, that may have, a, 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 on average, elastic modulus in the range of megapascal. So we know artificially to produce and, and machine materials that, that span a very wide range of elasticity, uh, um, uh, of uh, elastic properties. Now, if we look at the bottom part of the, of the slide, which actually is the same scale reporting how the biological materials or organs are actually sitting on that scale, you can see that in the biological media, we also have quite a large variety of these, uh, of these structures. So we have the bone is the stiffest uh, part of our, of our body in the gigapascal range, uh, and then the nervous system, and in particular, the brain is the softest part of the structure of our uh, human body, and it's typically on the kilopascal range. So we have materials that are man-made and we have materials that are biological that cover roughly the same scale, right? So that's good news. The bad news is that when you fabricate electronic devices, you're usually exploring material that sits on the left-hand side of the slide. So on the very high value of, gig of, uh, of elastic modulus. So typically silicon is in the tens of gigapascal for its um, elastic modulus. So it's a material that is very stiff. And when you want to position this device in proximity or even implant it into a, a very soft structure like the brain, this may create all sorts of challenges. And so over the past uh, decades or even a couple of decades now, uh, several groups uh, have started to actually try to see whether we could use some of these material, but try and think of structures we could push towards mechanical elasticity or mechanical compliance that would be more similar or closer to that of the, uh, the biological tissue we want to interface. So we now know how to process materials onto elastomeric structures. So this is uh, getting a bit closer to the nervous system, but we're not quite there yet in terms of yet making advanced electronic uh, system and circuits that match the, um, the, the exact uh, compliance of, of the brain. But we, we're getting there and there. Now what I will show in the second part of the talk is how we can actually combine these materials really, which are not designed to be soft and compliant, but yet we can, int uh, we can um, engineer structures so that they can, we can give them compliance. Now, the, um, the, the second thing to consider is, is scales. When you're designing bioelectronic system, you need to consider where you're going to position your device. And here I want to give an example of um, implants that you may want to design to, and position them at the very surface of the brain. So these are called cortical or epicortical uh, surface uh, arrays, and they would be sitting at the surface of the cortex. And here, what you see on the left is a collection of brains taken across multiple uh, species in the mammal kingdom, going from the, uh, the mouse all the way to the human. And uh, all of these are taken at the same scale. And I think what you can see from this photograph is, first of all, we have very different scales. You know, the mouse brain is really tiny compared to the human brain, but also the topology of the um, the, uh, of the of the surface of the brain is very different. The the rodent brain is very very smooth uh, uh, compared to uh, a non-human primate or or human uh, surface of the brain, which has a lot of gyrus at the surface. So it's a very complicated structure. So that means if you want to interface a device that you optimize for a mouse brain, for example, you know it may look very different in the end when you want to interface it at the surface of the human brain. And here I've borrowed uh, a, a, a figure that uh, uh, a table that is coming from a paper uh, from the group of Thomas Stiglitz, uh, where they actually looked carefully about curvatures and in particular of the, of the brain curvature and this across species. So you see these are cross section of the brain from the mouse to the human. And here you have the typical um, uh, brain curvature so that would, uh, if you were to, to trace a circle to match the, uh, the curvature of this brain, you would have, uh, that, would, that would be that radius. So here for the mouse, it goes from two millimeters, so it's very tiny, all the way to almost 20, milli, uh, uh, 20 millimeters for the, the, the brain here of the, uh, the, the curvature here of the smallest gy uh, gyrus in the human brain. And then you can 
use now as an engineer, if you want to position a device that can have sufficient bending uh, and, and actually, or sufficiently low bending stiffness to actually, uh, to actually conform such a, a curved structure or with a, 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 a radius, a very small radius of curvature, then you can actually compute the bending stiffness and what you, you can find. So that's the parameter D here. And this is actually modulated primarily by the material you choose. So E here is the elastic modulus we discussed before, and H is the thickness of your material. So here, in order to have the lowest stiffness possible, you want to have the, 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 the most compliant material, so a low elastic modulus, and the thinnest material possible, because also this parameter is to the cube, so your bending stiffness will go. So, the, from the equation, one may say, okay, I want the softest material in the finest format. But then when it comes to actually practical uh, usability of the system, you need to find a trade-off between how you can handle the structure and how you can and how compliant you want to, to have your structure. And here is a, a set of photographs um, that we've taken. This is a, a mock-up of the brain. So we, it's a, a it's a, it's a, it's made of a agarose gel, but it has the corrugation that uh, you would find on the human brain. And this is an example of an electrode array, a clinical electrode array that uh, would be made of a uh, of plain metal um, that is sitting at the surface of the brain. You can see that it sits pretty flat, so it doesn't really conform. It's it's quite rigid, so it does not conform well the surface of the brain. Now you can actually play with a, a whole range of uh, configuration, and here we we listed two typical material that we use to fabricate um, uh, such implant: PDMS, which is a silicone rubber, or polyimide (PI), which is um, a thermoplastic. And then, depending on the thickness of the material, you can actually compute the bending stiffness and you can see that for because the two materials have distinct elastic modulus of course you can get the same the pdms is softer than the polyimide so you can get thicker uh, materials for the same stiffness compared to the uh, to the pi but the big challenge is that for the pi for example if we go very thin so typically below uh, a few micron it, they become extremely difficult to manipulate and so therefore it's it's interesting to start working with materials like pdms which are which are softer than the thermoplastics but then give uh, allow you to 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 have thicker membranes so you can have a better handling of your device um, and um, then this was a, so the what I showed you before was for uh, in the context of the of the of the of the brain. You can actually do the same type of evaluation and calculation for the entire uh, nervous system. We've also done this on the context of the spinal cord, and this is really to give you uh, an idea of the the, the effect of uh, shape and size across species. So this is a cross section that is taken MRI scans that are taken uh, for the spinal cord at uh, this particular level here uh, along the spinal cord in the rats, in the non-human primate and in the human. And, you, and all of these images here, which are 3D reconstruction are at the same scale. So you can see that the, um, I'm not sorry, another just there are scales so that we can uh, uh, show um, uh, the, the, the differences. And here you see four millimeter for the mouse and then, um, and this is uh, 25 millimeter for the for the human. So again, you see that we have quite different dimensions. If you want to position an implant at the surface of the spinal cord, of course, you have to account for very distinct uh, bending radius. So these are imaging here is is an extremely important technique uh, that we use in order to get the right anatomy and the right metrics to to design the overall geometry of any bioelectronic interface we want to develop. Now, this was for static mechanical properties, but another extremely important parameter is also the dynamics of the system. And what you're looking at here is um, a, a little movies uh, that shows MRI uh, sequences of the human brain and of the spinal cord. Uh, while a person is is uh, is just uh, um, normally sitting into an MRI on the on the left hand side and on the right hand side, we are asking the person to move the the head uh, back and forth. So if we concentrate on the uh, the the cartoon on the left hand side, what you see this is an enhanced um, uh, MRI. 
So the displacement that you observe from that video is, is, a, is a little bit higher than what it is in, uh, in reality, but that gives the, 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 the information is that you can see that simply through regular blood flow and breathing of the person, the brain tissue, which are uh, what you, you see here encased in the, in the skull, are constantly moving and they move through you know, the, uh, the rhythm of the, of the blood flow. And this induces micro motion. And that's an important parameter because if you think of positioning a device that is somewhere in the vicinity of one of these most dynamic area of the brain, but even in the cortex here, we have quite some micro motion, then you end up with a structure where you have an implant that may be very rigid that is then surrounded by a structure that is constantly moving. And this generates a lot of adverse effects, in particular foreign body reaction. And then the implant usually tends to be isolated by the biological medium so that you have a, a poor interface uh, in the long term with the, with the, with the brain. So micro motion is an issue. And again, if you do something rigid into something soft and mobile, of course, you can anticipate this creates all sorts of challenges at the interface. But we also need to consider macro motion, and this is what you observe from the left and from the right hand side, where here we, we have a scan uh, of the person neck, and this is the spinal cord. And what you see that when the person is doing just a regular head movement, the tissue is actually stretched and, re and, and compressed quite a lot. So typically, the, uh, the, the spinal cord may deform by a few 10% uh, of elongation and contraction uh, through just a regular movement of the human body. So if you position an implant somewhere on, the, on, this, uh, on this area, you will see that you have a lot of uh, deformation and your implant better actually follow that macroscopic deformation not to impair or not to damage the underlying spinal cord. So the dynamics component, the dynamic component of the, this mechanical signature of the biological host is also very, very important and can help tailor and choose the right material for your bioelectronic interfaces. So if I summarize what I've discussed so far is that uh, we have um, uh, multiple scales that you need to know uh, where you want to interface your, your position, your, your device, so micro to centimeter, but also hundreds of uh, micrometers squared to a very large surface area. We have uh, very diverse biological tissue, so from stiff to soft material. And then we have very dynamic tissues, which uh, where you have hertz type of pulsing just due to uh, breathing and cardiac rhythm, but also a large deformation due to the regular movement of the, of the human body. So these are important metrics that you need to keep in mind when you select your material. So now let's see how we can select these materials because as uh, um, most of you will be aware of is that materials that we use to build electronic devices are usually made of metals. They use uh, semiconductor materials and all of these materials, or dielectric materials, all of these materials usually are very, uh, especially inorganic material are very rigid, very stiff. And so they're a priori not the right choice in order to have conformability, let alone elasticity. And so we spend quite some time uh, exploring how we could engineer elasticity. So this is what I call now elasticity by design. And this work really emanates from um, my uh, first, my postdoctoral stay when I was uh, back at Princeton and uh, with the extremely dynamic discussion and collaboration I had with Shi Gang Suo at the time he was in Princeton, now at Harvard and Sigrid Wagner. And I was working at the same time with Tang Li, who was doing his PhD at Princeton. And we worked very closely together to come up with some of these, uh, these concepts, which actually turned out to be the, um, the important concept to, that nearly all of the field now is, is using to engineer elasticity. So there's, no, there's a, a, f a few options you can think of to engineer elasticity. The first one is to make things flexible. And the best example or the best application to do this is actually the paper industry. If you think of a tree, which is a macroscopic stiff structure made of cellulose, um, and then you look at a piece of paper, which is also made of the very same material of cellulose, but has been processed in an extremely thin format, then you can get flexibility. You can't bend a tree trunk, but you can actually uh, bend a very thin uh, piece of paper. So that's concept one. If you make something thin enough, you will get flexibility. 
The second concept is uh, if you make correlation, if you actually pattern um, um, sine waves or repeated uh, the structures in, from your material, you should actually get ex some, some reversible deformation. And this, we initially had done that paper. I remember we, we, we actually literally put a paper in order to evaluate how we could design those uh, sinusoidal-like uh, structure in order to get reversible deformability. So corrugation or sine wave is something that um, can allow you to engineer elasticity. So when you do such design, the actual material itself stretches very little, but the overall structure macroscopically actually is able to accommodate deformation. So that's, that's really the trick in this, in this design. The third design is to do what we called at the time structuring or, or microstructuring. And what we found is that if you if you distribute specific cuts or openings into in a in a repeated pattern uh, across a, a piece of material that uh, initially is not deformable, but if you engineer these little cuts well enough, uh, then we actually discovered that you could actually reversibly deform the structure by allowing the ligaments of the structure to tilt out of the plane and therefore have. These uh, these different uh, uh, this this extension uh, enabled. So that's a third concept. And more recently, we worked in the lab on a fourth concept, which is uh, what we call now biphasic material. So where we actually process materials so that they have both a liquid and a solid phase. And by having a liquid material embedded uh, into a, a solid structure, we can actually use the the flow of the liquids to accommodate. Uh, potential um, elongation and yet maintain uh, uh, the, the required electrical performance. So we have now these four structures or four approaches to, to engineer materials or structures and, and get and design elasticity. So I just want to spend a bit uh, of more time of one of the, the, the key technology we're using, which is the microstructuration and the formation of those micro cracks in gold fin films that we deposit on silicone rubber. And what you see here is that these are SCM, so scanning electron microscope images um, that are taken on a gold film that uh, before stretching, during stretching, and after many cycles of stretching. And we have those little cuts that are distributed in the gold surface, and they, uh, um, they enable and they rearrange during the stretch. So we stretch along the x-axis here, and they rearrange so that we can actually have this macroscopic deformability. So this is really a key structure, um, a, a, a key uh, design that enables the elasticity in gold films. And by doing this through percolation, we have electrical continuity. So this works well for gold film. This is actually, we found out that this was a spontaneous uh, mechan growth mechanism for the gold films onto our elastomer. But then we spent some time trying to think of wh whether we could engineer directly those little cuts or those microstructure so that we can then open the, the concept or the design to a wider range of material. So we spent some time and we're still uh, working on optimizing this further. Uh, but we, we basically did this experiment where we played with multiple distributed pattern, and then we did both microscopic simulation and uh, finite element uh, uh, simulation to see which type of pattern would allow to have a microscopic deformation with a minute or very small residual strain into the structure. And this is one example. This is a polyimide that has been um, shaped with those uh, sort of Y microscopic shape. We stretch it by 10% and just this specific geometry allows us to, uh, to go no higher than 4% in terms of residual elongation in the structure. So we can further optimize the structure. We can play with the actual exact shape of the pattern we're replicating. But um, this is now to show you that you can actually com convey this concept to material that are extremely brittle, like ITO. So with this, this test where here we have a PET sheet, which is a, also a thermoplastic, onto which we deposit the thin layer of um, indium tin oxide, which is a very brittle material. But then, so you can, if you, if you start stretching um, or even bending ITO, you would usually induce catastrophic cracking. But what we found is that when we have this pattern, and here you see a cartoon of the structure, this is a photograph of the pattern 
when the sample is held at zero strain or 10% strain. And then we monitor the uh, relative resistance, electrical resistance of the film as we're stretching it. And you see that on the top graph, this is to show that we can stretch very far before we actually have electrical failure. And then we can also cycle the sample. This is to 10% strain. And the overall change of the resistance is actually not, not changing. So we can engineer elasticity into ITO. So this Kirigami designs um, is a, an effective way of introducing elasticity and programming basically electromechanical performance in a range of, of materials. Um, and now we've actually really pushed the, uh, this concept into integrating and miniaturizing this system. And we now use these approaches to fabricate microelectrode arrays for some of our bioelectronic application uh, based on polyimide uh, uh, as a carrier material, platinum film film as electrode and interconnect materials, all embedded in silicone rubber in order to form microstructures uh, but yet uh, fully elastic um, uh, uh, stretchable conductors and electrodes. Um, and now moving to the second approach, so, so the micro crack is one, one approach, but it's actually pretty um, intensive in terms of uh, work you have to do in the clean room in order to, to do the, the, the micro structuration, because if you want to fabricate a very large surface area implants, you have to actually have an extremely high density of those uh, micro structures. So this is time consuming. And for some application, actually it may turn out that the, the second time approach um, uh, might be more efficient. And so this is an example of such, a, such an approach. What you're looking at here is now a cross section of, the, of two serpentines. So we prepare them polyimide, uh, and then we also use platinum as the, the electrical conductor. And then we use those, uh, those serpentine as the uh, elastic conductors to drive and bring uh, power to micro LEDs that we embed in the structure. And one question that we had was, well, when we do the structure, is the polyimide actually mechanically loading our, our, uh, the elastomer? And do we lose some of the elasticity and the compliance by doing this hybrid structure that is composed of the polyimide with the elastomer? And so what we did is a test where we have here is a stress strain curve of pure polyimide. So we have this uh, typical uh, elastic modulus of five gigapascal. We have the same curve now for bulk PDMS. And so here we're uh, to a much softer material, so one megapascal. And the, at the center, it's actually the same stress strain curve in black that is now with the hybrid structure where we have the PDMS, um, the polyimide serpentines with the platinum. And you see that we have a little bit of the stiffening of the material. So compared to the one megapascal, we have now an, an effective modulus of the structure that is uh, about five megapascal. But yet we have a structure that remains very compliant. And more importantly also is that we probe or we monitor um, a change in resistance as we stretch the structure. And we, we see that uh, the serpentine allows to maintain absolutely stable electrical conductivity. So that's another approach to design uh, our, our um, stretchable structure. So now that we have um, uh, an approach to build our, our uh, elasticity in some of the structure, we now need to think of the next step. Okay, so metallization, for example, is just one element of an entire bioelectronic system. When you design a bioelectronic system, you need to think of transducers, so electrodes or a range of uh, uh, transducers that will uh, either record or, or, or stimulate activity in, in, the, in the biological medium or environment, but then you want to develop some sort of instrumentation that allows to drive or to uh, record efficiently or multiplex efficiently the um, information that you're collecting from your devices. And ultimately we want to have systems that are fully wireless. So you need also to integrate telemetry. And this is where big challenges are, are, are occurring. Um, and you have multiple approach to, to, to explore today. There's a there's not really a, 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 a yet a, an, an agreed upon uh, approach or technology to build this entire system because a lot of the uh, work is still uh, need to be um, to be conducted. But one big challenge is really negotiating the mechanical of the, uh, uh, constraint associated with these uh, hybrid system. 
Um, if you want high performance, if you need to have very high density of transducers, you will most likely go to some sort of instrumentation that will be CMOS based, so traditional microelectronics based, like the one you see here on the cartoon. The LEDs that are flashing here are actually small PCB that integrate multiple LEDs. So these are very stiff structures. And so then, although they're embedded into a very compliant structure, you still need to negotiate very sharp changes in strain between the, the region of your interface that is really elastic versus the region of your interface that is completely rigid. And at this interface, this delta of strain, if you want, that uh, goes to, uh, to several tens of percent, uh, actually very often uh, completely catastrophic for the reliability and stability of the structure. Uh, in the center here, I put a photograph. Another approach is to actually directly design fin film transistor or film electronic um, processing uh, structure directly on the soft material. But even there, even if you try to optimize the, 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 the materials here, you also need to negotiate those sharp, stiff to soft uh, transition. And so there's a, a lot of things to still be optimized in terms of the mechanical designs and the reliability of the system, because you need to negotiate the peak strains. You need to also ensure that the, the overall system doesn't fatigue. If you design an implant, for example, that is uh, um, to be used for monitoring the cortical activity of a patient over years, you don't want your device to actually fatigue and fail after a year or so, because the, the, the device needs to actually perform throughout the lifetime of the patient. So usually this is many years. So uh, mechanical gradients is also another big challenge that uh, re will require further efforts in terms of optimization and in terms of microfabrication and microtechnology and connectors and how you integrate these different co components together. So now I want to go to uh, the third part of the talk, which is now that we have seen how we could uh, manipulate material, integrate material together to get soft uh, electronic system. Now I want to go and describe a little bit how we characterize the system. Also keep in mind that um, in standard electronics, you know, a lot of the platform and the structure that you use to characterize devices is really meant for structures that are flat, rigid and, mo and, and static, right? So now we actually need to think of approaches where everything is moving and, and, and very compliant. So one typical test that we, uh, we, we need to conduct is what we call electromechanical characterization. Not only you want to monitor the performance of the electrical device, but you want to monitor its performance while it's being deformed. And here I give you example of typical test we conduct um, uh, uh, for, this is um, uh, micro LEDs that are integrated with the serpentine uh, uh, interconnect that I showed before. So the first test you will do is to actually look at the purely electrical function of your system. So you integrate the system, you first check that all of the electrical continuity and the performance of the device is the one you expected. So these are typical IV curves that you will have from any uh, LEDs um, that you bias. Then the second step is to actually monitor the voltage the current that uh, we bias the, the, the LED at a specific current, so 5 milliamp in that context. But now we actually apply cycling, so mechanical cycling of our device to a specific value. So in this case, 15%. Uh, and then we monitor the voltage that is required to bias uh, the, uh, this LED. Uh, the resulting voltage that uh, can be measured across the LED as a function of the cyclic evaluation, uh, cy cyclic fatigue. And on this case, you see that you have a, quite a stable response of the LED, even of the LED system, even after a 100,000 cycle. Um, what is important is, is the value of of, that you choose for your strain. And we never go to extremely large strains because physiologically, actually, it's quite rare that you have deformation that go beyond 20%. And so a lot of the fatigue testing that we conduct in the lab is usually between 10 and 20% because these are actually the realistic um, uh, spec that you need from the biological environment. And then 
The next step you want to do is uh, evaluating how the device performs when it's exposed to ions, because the human body is made of, um, uh, it's primarily made of ions and in particular salty uh, ions. And so in a way to, to mimic the uh, what the device would be exposed to when it's implanted, then you can dip the device into a saline solution bias the device and monitor again that uh, resulting uh, voltage over days of exposure into the saline environment and you see whether or not the structure is stable. So that's one type of a, a characterization. Then if you develop electrodes that are designed in particular to record or stimulate the nervous system, one uh, characterization that is uh, a must is uh, the uh, electro electrochemical impedance characterization. So you want to measure the impedance of your electrode, which is impedance as you can see. Here, these are multiple examples of electrodes. And what uh, the take home hit message from these plots is that these electrodes have multiple shapes, multiple materials. And of course, depending on all of this geometry and the type of material you're using, the impedance of your material will differ. So you have a, 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 this typical tri uh, uh, tri electrode um, recording system that you, you need to, to use in order to fully characterize your electrode and you can measure the modulus and the phase of your impedance. And so these are absolutely must experiment or characterization that you do when you use this soft structure or any actually bioelectronic uh, electrode, bioelectrodes that you want to position in the body. And then what, of course, because we are developing electrodes that are meant to be deformed, you now need to combine this electrochemical performance with mechanical deformation. And so we've developed now the, the system in the lab where we have the uh, EIS system. So we do the electro impedance spectroscopy while we're actually stretching the device into a liquid. And then you can record again, the impedance modulus as a function of strain. And what you see in this experiment is that as we're stretching the device, the impedance will go up. But here, actually, in this particular sample, not by so much because it's just a couple of kilo ohms uh, difference. And then when you reduce the strain and you recover to zero, your impedance recover its initial value. So you have a structure that can survive the, um, the overall stretch, but you have to be aware that the the gold in particular, in, in this case, the gold actually acts, uh, uh, resistance is actually changing with the applied strain. So then we've done a lot of these tests and we have a lot of those experimental setup in the lab. But then at some point we, we said, well, you know, we have all of this testing to be done. Is there a way to combine all of this structure and do all three at once so that we have an automated system that gives us information about reliability, about, um, mechanical stability and electrochemical performance. And so we came up with a, a, this design of what we call a biomimetic multimodal platform. It's a structure that you see here, where we combine electrical uh, recording with mechanical deformation that is in a physiological context. And, and here we, we've done this, and I'll, I'll go to the next slide where there's a little video where you can see the, the, the structure in action. But there, what we've done is that we've replicated the cervical region where we want to position our implant. And the movement that you see here in the structure is exactly the replica of the type of deformation that the head and, uh, or the neck would do when you move your head. And so then we position the device into uh, the, the, the implant here. So we have a, an implant that is then uh, inserted or uh, into a, a spinal cord mockup that is into those 3D printed vertebra. And then we can connect through uh, this cable here and uh, outside of the incubator. Then we can uh, measure the uh, electrical resist impedance of the um, electrochemical impedance of all of these electrodes that are now sitting in a very realistic bio biomimetic environment. And with this, we can do then at, at once all of the characterization I've described before, where you monitor impedance as a function of mechanical cycling. And you can now then test multiple electro technology or interconnect technologies. So now the last part of the talk um, is um, to talk a little bit of efforts that are conducting in translating some of this technological innovation to a clinical application. So we've had this nice 
proof of concept. You know, you have a new device, a soft device. It looks great. In, it works well in, in uh, our structure. Uh, but then how do we go into translating and using these, uh, these devices to, to um, uh, human or more um, uh, yeah, clinical-like uh, environment? And so what uh, we need to do is, of course, scaling, first of all, because when you do your proof of context, this is always um, uh, into small animal models. Then we need to look at carefully, again, at the manufacturing and the reproducibility of the device, look at the compatibility of the, of the, of the structure, and then quantify carefully the stability and reliability of the system. And so we came up with this, uh, what we call this translational framework, where you, know, you start from your proof of concept and then you want to aim for a clinical trial, but actually there's a lot of work to do in between. And this is where we currently are with most of the project uh, and technology we, we have in the lab. So I've showed you this uh, critical step with this biomimetic validation where the soft materials are, are integrated with more controlled manufacturing and tested into a, the most realistic environment you can have in vitro. Once actually the devices pass all of those tests, if they fail, you need to do failure mode analysis and, and, and return. But once they pass, then you have to go through in vivo validation into animal models that are, uh, especially for uh, uh, neuroscience, that are actually typically non-human primate. And so I will show you now some of the uh, example of the work we and how we've translated the work um, uh, in the past five years. So five years ago, we started working with our colleague Grégoire Courtin here at the PFL, who is an expert in spinal cord injury and restoring locomotion after spinal cord injury. And then together, we've come up with uh, the design of uh, Edura, this electro, uh, electronic dura matter. Uh, um, uh, implant, which is an implant that is designed to sit at the surface of the spinal cord, just below the natural dura mat. And there, we, what we had shown at the time is that if we have a, a rat with a spinal cord injury, uh, and we position in light blue here, this is in this colorized um, CT scan, the implant is sitting just uh, uh, at the surface of the spinal cord below the site of injury, we can use this, this device to deliver electrical pulses at a specific uh, location on the roots of the spinal cord and help restore motion in the, in the limbs, which should be paralyzed because of the spinal cord injury. So this was a, a very nice uh, adventure. And now actually we're in the process or we're working hard in translating the technology now from the rodent to uh, non-human non uh, primates. And so the first thing we had to do was to actually completely redesign the devices because as I mentioned before, the dimensions are very different. So this is cross-section of the spine for a rat. This is one of the uh, non-human primate model that we have. And so we had to uh, rethink a little bit some of the, the size of the electrode, the length of the tracks, the connector structure. Uh, but ultimately we, we managed to, to do this. We also stabilized a lot the process, the fabrication process. So now we do wafer scale uh, microfabrication, our soft electrode. And this is an example of um, uh, an electrode array that we've designed for the cervical. So this is really using exactly the environment I showed you with our multimodal system, where we can deliver a range of electrical pulses to various routes. And here, what you see on the right-hand side is the uh, uh, EMG, so the muscle activity from three different muscles in the forelimb. And you can see that depending on which electrode we stimulate, we elicit various response from the muscle. So that was a good, that's a good uh, validation of the, of the technology. And we've now actually used the, the, the benefit of microfabrication to tailor the design of our, of our microelectrode through any position along the spinal cord. So I think now we've covered nearly entirely for a range of application, the surface of the spinal cord. And every time we validate systematically the impedance of the electrode, and then we do these uh, muscle uh, recruitment curves in order to um, define which uh, type of uh, muscle are recruited through this uh, uh, epidural or subdural stimulation. So that's where we are today with uh, advancing this um, technology. And, uh, I think I'll uh, now wrap the, the talk and I, I hope I've convinced you that uh, we can do a lot of um, novel 
bioelectronic system using or, elect, uh, or simple electrode system using soft material, but combining them with advanced manufacturing and, and uh, elasticity design. So we can combine the performance of the devices with the mechanical compliance that is needed to position the interfaces onto the human body or onto a living body. Um, it's very important that we, we optimize this design against realistic um, constraints. So the, I, I firmly believe that we have to push for this multimodal and biomimetic platform to help design better this, uh, this structure. Um, and then um, also, I hope I've convinced you that uh, even in academia, we can actually push some of these translational efforts, which are of course long-term and tedious because you need to do a lot of experiment, a lot of, of reproducibility experiment as well. The type of work, if you want to embark into this type of research, you have to really embrace uh, interdisciplinary research because the, work you, you, the input and the expertise you need in this type of, uh, of research goes from material science to micro technology via electrical engineering and of course bioengineering and neuroscience. So there's a lot of, uh, it's a very dynamic and diverse uh, pool of expertise that is needed. So you need to work as, uh, as teams. Um, and then also you have to, you learn through experience that you need to align the performance uh, to your expectations. So it's very different to say, you have a proof of concept that works once in a rat to actually something that will perform exactly the same in humans. So this is something uh, I, I want just to have a word of caution on this is that now I see too many, often we see a lot of papers that says, you know, this is a proof of concept that will revolutionize uh, neuroprosthetic medicine. Actually, I think we should be a little cautious because there's a lot of work in terms of system engineering and system optimization to be done before we reach the, uh, the clinical expectation. But uh, this is a, a, a stimulating uh, a domain and a lot of work uh, ahead, but a very exciting domain. And with this, then I would like also to um, thank the people who actually do all the work. So this is a photograph of uh, the team taken a few months ago. Um, and so uh, it's a really a great group of uh, students and postdoc and engineers really working hand in hand, going from the clean room to the surgical room. So it's uh, I, I, you know, I couldn't have a, a better group. I'm really happy with uh, all of uh, the work that is conducting in the team. Of course, we work also very closely with uh, colleagues at the Center for Neuroprosthetic and in particular, the teams of Grégoire Courtine and Jocelyn Bloch. And then I'd like to thank various sources of funding who support also this um, this work and thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Professor Lacour, for a wonderful talk about using uh, design metal materials for new prosthetics. Um, and uh, I am joined with uh, Professor Xin Sun. Uh, let me introduce him. Uh, he is a professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing. And he got his PhD uh, at Tsinghua and uh, PhD at MIT. Then he obtained his uh, postdoctoral training at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign in the U.S. Uh, and the, um, he's now a uh, professor at Tsinghua University. Uh, and we are also joined by uh, Dr. Hong Zhang Wang, who is a postdoctoral scholar at uh, Tsinghua University's biomedical engineering department. Uh, so he got his PhD in the same department and he's now continuing as a postdoctoral uh, uh, scholar. And he uh, works on liquid metal based uh, flexible electronics and he has published uh, quite extensively in the field. Uh, so with that, uh, the um, panelists will join me and uh, uh, we'll, we'll start from there. Okay, hi, Xin Yu, you have to turn on your camera now. Yes. Yeah, we couldn't see you. Okay, now we can see you. Sorry, yeah. I forgot. Yeah, normally our panel was to start with our challengers. Yeah, so extra challenger today is Hong Zhang Wang. Yeah, Hong Zhang, please. Yeah, okay. Thanks for your kind introduction, Professor Alice. And Professor Lacour, thank you. It's very impressive talk and from which I learned a lot. This is Hong Zhang Wang from Tsinghua University. It's my honor to ask the first question. 
My research mainly focuses on the liquid metal and its diverse applications. You know, the liquid metal materials have both properties of the liquid and the metal. Liquid metal and uh, its composites, <coughs> such com composite with the PDMS or other polymers, presents a tissue-like softness and the metal-like conductivity. So I think it might be a very prom pro promising materials to be utilized in seamless interaction of the um, biological systems and the electronic devices. So um, how do you think about the new liquid matter will contribute to the development of the bioelectric uh, interface? What are the promising applications and the remaining challenges to be solved? Thank you. All right, thank you very much for the question. And indeed, uh, liquid metal is an emerging um, uh, options uh, or alternative to, to have elasticity in the, in the system. So in the slide where I present the various uh, approach for elasticity, uh, this is one of the, four, that's the fourth one. So the use of biphasic material or liquid or solid uh, interfaces. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, uh, very exciting work that can be done with liquid metal in particular because you can combine high electrical conductivity with the, the flow and the uh, deformability of a liquid. So I think that's the prime benefit of, uh, of using liquid metal is that you can have very high or metal-like really uh, electrical conductivity, which you don't really have in any of the other approach because the other approaches where you do very thin films or the microstructured film, the trade-off is that then you have a higher resistance. So the liquid metal in that sense is an interesting approach. The challenge with the liquid metal is, uh, first of all, how you manipulate the materials. Um, um, historically, a lot of the work with liquid metal was done with uh, microfluidics, so making a micro channel that you fill with, uh, with the liquid metal in order to form um, sort of a liquid uh, metal structures. Um, this is a bit bulky. Now there's a lot of work that has been done in using either um, composites, so microspheres of these um, that percolate into the, uh, the silicone rubber. Uh, my lab has been working in evaporating liquid metal onto an alloying uh, rigid uh, matrix that allows to have compatibility with um, photolithography and micro patterning. So that's uh, also an interesting um, uh, then uh, approach. Um, so you can, there's a lot of progress now in terms of the man manipulation of these, uh, of the liquid metal for soft structures, so that's good. One challenge that we found um, is also that because it's liquid, and if you use it in a fairly thin format, there's a lot of, the, the liquid metal will be prone to electromigration. And so you have to be a little cautious when you bias, and in terms of the application you use for your, your structure, um, in how you're going to bias the, the, the device because you may end up with zones that are completely depleted from your liquid metal. So this is something you have to be a little cautious about when you design your circuit and the overall system. And uh, I guess the final comment for um, implementing liquid metal for implantable in particular application, of course, we have no idea about the toxicity in the long term of these materials. So there's a currently no flags that says this is toxic, but there's also no demonstration that this is compatible to the point that we can actually start thinking of uh, using this for implantable beyond proof of concept uh, uh, devices. Mm, okay, thank you. Thanks for asking. Any other questions, Hong Kong? Yeah, okay. My second question is about the neural processes. Reprocesses, uh, I think it can collect the artificial intelligence and the biological intelligence, showing very exciting prospect in near future. So in your opinion, how far do you think the neural processes could achieve in 10 years, like its application in our daily life? Is it possible to decode our higher level uh, brain activity, such as the emotion and the memory, I think? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. And I think um, this is something certainly a lot of people are wondering th these days about uh, the impact, the combination of artificial intelligence with human intelligence. And, mm -hmm. um, 
And, and we start to see extremely compelling demonstration of using fairly simple uh, interfaces to actually decode uh, cognitive uh, information. Oh. So I think we, we, we are on track to use technology to decode very sophisticated information from the human brain. Mm. Whether this is going to be, you know, mainstream and uh, used in every single application, I think there's still a lot of work to do. A lot of the demonstration today are done either with extremely localized um, region of the brain or if they use non-invasive interfaces like EEG type of, uh, of structure, it's a very average type of uh, information. Um, so I think you have, again, it's, it's coming back to what I said at the end of the talk, we have to align expectation with what the technology can actually deliver. Mm -hmm. um, this being said, I think we, we, we have to be proactive and carefully think of, you know, what are the ethical challenges associated with this? Uh, because, of course, if you start extracting information or da uh, neural data from people, then you have to, to be cautious about what you do with it. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's something that uh, I think many, many groups now worldwide are starting to think about uh, neural ethics. And this is something that needs to be considered. Okay, but the technology yeah. has yet to be improved, right, before it's completely distributed, especially the implantable one. There's ma major challenges associated with power consumption and uh, wireless uh, uh, transmission of the information. Okay. Yes, yeah, so a very, very nice question. Actually, I remember my talk from Alice to Alita. Yeah, that's a long way. Yeah. So... Uh, okay, now I give the chance to our panelists, uh, Xing, uh, Sheng Xing, yeah, I know you have a lot of questions and related to your research also related. Xing, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Professor Zhang. Yeah, hi, Professor Laku, uh, nice to meet you here, and thanks for your wonderful talk, very inspiring. Uh, I'm Xing Shen from Tsinghua University. Actually, I'm from the Department of Electronic Engineering. Uh, uh, your talk today is mostly on uh, the implantable device for the applications for the, the peripheral neural system and the spinal cord, right? Which is which is great. And also, I think there are a lot of space to explore in in the brain parts. Uh, so, do you have any work on the, the brain implants? And uh, do you imagine any uh, clinical application for that aspect of the the device? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I focus mostly on the spinal cord indeed, but we do also have uh, 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 several projects uh, onto a cortical implant, but uh, mostly ECOG, so epicortical uh, devices that you position at the surface of the of the cortex. So um, this can so ECOGs is a are a good uh, technology to really uh, record uh, average. Uh, low field potential activity from uh, from the brain, uh, and so this is a uh, one one direction where we're currently exploring. Uh, we haven't really yet um, uh, pushed or, or at least published very much onto penetrating structures because um, one of the big challenge that we we found for doing what is called intracortical probes, so probes that you push into the the, the brain, is that um, you need to have sufficient stiffness in your material to actually insert it. And uh, a lot of the approach we're following in the group is really to match the compliance of the, of the, of the tissue. And currently one of the big uh, challenges is really how do you push something to things up? And uh, so the, we are exploring various routes at the moment to, in order to do this, but we, we haven't yet, we're not yet ready to share what we, what we have. But that's uh, for a lot of the project, a lot of the people working in, the, in neural engineering, this is a, a big challenge to find materials and devices that you can insert into the brain and that trigger minimum foreign body reaction. Because a lot of the challenges associated with these devices, which are very often used for recording neuronal information, is the stability over time of these recordings. And one thing that affects the stability is actually the, the, the buildup of a scarring uh, around the implant that sort of separates your recording device from the neurons you want to record from. And so there's a lot of demonstration of 
I insert a device, I record for a day, a few weeks, but actually it's uh, the longer term remains a challenge because there's still scarring in many of the approaches that uh, people have been exploring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so that's, a, that's a different from the spinal cord. Do you face the similar problem for spinal cord, the long-term recording and uh, this scarring? So it, it's, yeah, it's different because on the mm -hmm. spinal cord, we remain on the surface. So mm -hmm. we've actually matched the mechanical property of the dura mater, which is the protective skin of the spinal cord, mm -hmm. but we don't penetrate the spinal cord. So there okay. we don't have this issue of, uh, of this uh, exacerbated uh, foreign body reaction because we're not getting, we're not pushing into the spine. I see. And we also, and also the, the, the mode of operation is different because in the spinal cord, we do stimulation. We don't do recording of the information. I see. And, and I also noticed that for some uh, devices used for peripheral nerve, they use this kind of a cuff structure to have a more efficient recording and uh, stimulation functions. So in your structure, is it just uh, attached on the surface or it's also a, a cuff structure that can be surrounded. No, we, it, when we work on refer nerves, so do cuffs. So we do structures that are wrapped around the, around mm -hmm. the nerve. Uh, and this is primarily to steer the device in position. Uh, a big challenge is, uh, is getting sufficient selectivity in the recording, because in the peripheral nerves, you have, you have to think of the, you know, a peripheral nerve is a little bit like a telephone cable. So you have thousands of wires which are individual axons in parallel. So the challenge is actually to listen to only one of those axons and not to get the, the typical background noise from all of the uh, uh, activity. Um, and so with a curve electrode, it's actually pretty challenging to get specificity in the recording. Uh, and that's a, but that's a, a minimally invasive uh, approach. So that's also a trade-off between implantation versus long-term stability. Right, right, right. I think for the carpal structure also there are some uh, you know, trouble for the safety. Yeah. Well, on CUF actually are used today at the clinic. So there are several system in particular for the vagus nerve uh, where you will have a tripolar electrode that are used in the vagus nerve. But if you want to have a higher density of channels for recording, then actually the big challenge is all of the wiring that you need to, uh, to interface and extract the information from the recording. Okay, yeah. So here, yeah. yeah. Uh, here I have uh, several questions from the audience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one uh, audience named the Red Bean. He asked how does the enzyme affect in the failure of flexible golden, you know, electrode, the golden electrode. Sorry, I didn't get the question. Could you repeat, please? How does the enzyme affect in the failure uh, of a flexible gold electrode? How the measurement affects? No, no I think it's about enzyme. Yeah. Right? Enzyme. Oh, en en enzymes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so the gold uh, material is, in, is embedded. It's not exposed to the biological environment. So we always work with a sandwich structure. We have the elastomer, the gold, and then the elastomer. Um, so first of, so then the, the gold is not exposed to the enzyme. And even mm -hmm. at the electrode site, at the electrode site, we use a, a platinum uh, silicone composite. So the gold is actually protected from that. Um, it's true, however, that uh, currently the approach we have uh, is probably not going to be suitable for a lifelong implantation because we only use silicone and we know silicone is quite porous to water and to uh, oxygen. So most likely uh, structures like enzymes will eventually diffuse to the structure. So the, there's some work to be done for longer term encapsulation of the structure. Okay. So they should save the problem for the leakage, yeah? If there are no leakages through the packaging, that will be more safe, yeah. Exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah, another question is for, uh, from a, a young Shui Jian. It looks like a karigami not only has X, Y dimension change, but also Z dimension changed. So will it be any limitation on the comfortability 
uh, on the bio interface and how do you so, uh, solve this problem? So for yes, that's a very good dimension. that's a very good question um, and this is absolutely correct in order for the kirigami to work in terms of strain engineering you need to have the uh, um, displacement in the in the z axis so you need to have a displacement in the x and y but also a tilt in the z axis so that means uh, depending on the scale of your kirigami structure, you will have a more or less dis small or large displacement of your structure. So if we do macroscopic uh, design, so typically, you know, where the kirigami structure is of the millimeter scale, then we will have bending and deflection of the order of a millimeter. So this is something you, uh, of course, need to account for uh, when you want to interface that with, uh, with another structure. So if you position this at the surface of the body, at the skin, for example, that means that most likely your skin is going to, um, to prevent some of this 3D deformation. And so yeah. there it's actually, you will need to miniaturize even further to ensure that the deflection occurs within the elastomer packaging and is not actually reaching the skin uh, or the carrier material. So there's a lot of optimization still with these kirigami structures. Okay, very great. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, Xin Yu, are you okay? Yeah. So sounds yeah. weird. Okay. Can I maybe have one short question? Sure. Yeah. So we again, great talk. And uh, I was just wondering if, um, so what would be, what would be considered, what would be the criteria for success for for in terms of clinical application, um, um, oh, that's a that's a very tough question. Um, so I think uh, it really is function of what uh, medical condition we're targeting, right? Um, the success will be that the device that uh, you produce through this soft bioelectronic interface enables something really that the current technology is not allowed to deliver. Um, and, um, you know, if, if we consider uh, the, uh, you know, recording from the brain, for example, at the moment, there's a very strong limitation in terms of the layout of the, of the uh, ECOGs or on the brain implants that are available. And very often when you talk to the clinicians, they will say, ah, the device was too small, was too stiff, was not the right shape, etc." And I think one, I believe that the fact that we introduce uh, microfabrication into uh, the design of these implants will give us much more flexibility to tailor the actual interfaces to the very need of the patient. Of course, there's a lot of thinking to be done in terms of the, the quality management and the, the, the validation of, the, of these devices because Currently, when you do a clinical device, you know, you freeze the design and you have to do all sorts of steps to validate and their characterization and their stability. So introducing changes in the layout of the device may actually have also consequences on what you validated to bring it to the clinic. So there's a lot of thinking to, to be done there. But I think, um, yeah, if we can demonstrate that with these softer devices, you can either do closed loop system or, or, or provide much higher resolution of a large surface area, for example, of the recording of the brain that enables to, to understand much better or provide better diagnostic tools. I think this would be something uh, exciting. But there's, of course, many types of application where you can, uh, you, this, could be, um, this could be used. So you, here, this is where the connection with the clinician is critical because for us as engineers or material scientists, you know, it's difficult to predict what will be the key application. So it's really, we need the input from the clinicians. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. I'm very yeah. happy with that answer. Yeah, actually, you're leading a big group, you know, in your university. I is working on this direction too. Could you give us some comments on this? And what's you thinking about that? So, yeah, so I think this is why we, um, Actually, the Center for Neuroprosthetic that we have at the PFL really it was built on this idea that you, you bring clinicians with engineers, with neuroscientists in order to identify 
key clinical and medical challenges where we can, we need to push the technology innovation. And so a very successful story that we have in the center is uh, the work led by uh, our colleague on spinal cord injury, where you know we went from the concept that I showed you, you know, in the rat with the spinal cord injury, and today mm -hmm. the colleagues have now launched several clinical trials where inpatient they've been able to restore. Um, locomotion in, in patients mm. who had a, a spinal cord injury for many years ago. So that's really by working together uh, in, 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 in very interdisciplinary group that you can actually go much beyond what you would be able to do in one lab. We have similar example uh, also with the, uh, on the cognitive area where with non-invasive techniques. Uh, so there's a lot of um, uh, benefit of, of actually bringing knowledge and competencies together. And this is actually a must if you want to do any advances in this type of research. Yes, actually now everyone should be working with others and uh, you know, get exactly. to the I think that's a, we, we, we were done with the, we need to have extremely solid foundation in each of the disciplines, but we need to actually encourage people to bridge uh, and cross disciplines. Right, exactly, yeah. So, uh, Sheng Xing, yeah, I know you done a lot of interesting work and uh, very, you know, exciting. Uh, how you work with all the other people in other, de uh, you know, uh, department or even in the hospital? Yeah, could you share something with us? Well, that's that is exactly the question I want to ask uh, <laughs> Professor Laku as well. Yeah, I come from the background of optics and electronics. Yeah, I'm in the department of electronic engineering and. Uh, Several years ago, I got interested into the biomedical research, especially neuroscience and neuroengineering, and I tried to uh, uh, implement our microscale uh, optoelectronic devices into the, the new neuroscience and try to do uh, neural signal sensing and stimulation, something like uh, the wireless optogenetic stimulation and the wireless uh, uh, optical recording for the neural system. Yeah, so the, my question for Pro Professor Lacoe is that also, as a, a scientist with an engineering background, you also have an engineering background, right? You are doing mechanical science and the mechanical engineering. And you got involved into the, the biomedical engineering research. And how do you overcome this, this kind of a challenge in your early career as a, a PhD <laughs> student right, with an engineering, the mechanical engineering background, and then to do the biomedical science? And what suggestion do you have for this? younger generation of students and scientists when they want to do mm -hmm. this translational research. Very yeah. um, so um, the, yeah, so I'm trained as an electrical engineer. So that's oh, my nice. uh, initial uh, master and PhD uh, and electrical engineering, but on the device side. So I, I was always very close to uh, microfabrication and micro devices. Um, and so um, in terms of the training, I think for the younger, if you are interested in embarking in such um, a highly interdisciplinary uh, program or research, you first need to get a solid degree of, in one of the main engineering categories. So either you choose material science, electrical, mechanical engineering, doesn't matter. Everything is linked at some point to, with, uh, with some bio, bio application. So I think you need to have a strong uh, focus on first as at your bachelor or master level. And then when you choose your PhD, this is then you need to choose to do it in a group that uh, is embracing uh, multidisciplinary research. Um, well, one thing that uh, you have to be prepared of is that, uh, that it's possible that uh, in such a group, and I see this in, in my lab, the student and the postdoc in the team have very different backgrounds. So you also have to be, so within the group already, you have to be challenged by the others because they are not exactly from the same background as you are. So you want to learn from the others and exchange ideas already at this level. Um, and then uh, you have to be curious. I think that's the, the key is really uh, be curious and then team up with people also who know what you do not know. Um, you know, I, I don't do neuroscience. We actually uh, collaborate with the with key groups who help us in setting up experiment. And then once this is uh, set up, then we can start doing some of our own experiment. But at the start, this is 
you know, one structure that is really positive about our center here is that uh, we do a lot of research through the other labs as well and things we would be, that would be very difficult to do alone. So I don't know if this, uh, so I, how I came up with uh, doing such interdisciplinary research was really, I think, driven by curiosity and, uh, and also trying to thinking of applying what we do as engineer for uh, biological and medical applications. So that's basically what drove me. So yeah. Professor Leku, how you found your partner? And so you're working with different people, so you came to their lab or you came to the hospital, how you found them? <laughs> yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. And I think there you need to be extremely proactive. So. Uh, indeed, you need to go and talk to uh, biologists, to neuroscientists, and to uh, to hospital, to clinicians. So, mm -hmm. um, in every institution I've been um, as after my PhD, I actually very very quickly reached out to to people who are in BME, people who are in uh, in neuroscience, so that actually we could learn also uh, uh, from each other and establish a common language. So you have to go and look for the people. Yes. Okay, very nice. Uh, actually, we also have a question online. It was from uh, Jiang Ying from Nanyang Technology of University in Singapore. He's asking for, you mentioned that the biggest challenge of integration of soft and rigid electronics. What's the requirement for connection of soft and rigid or soft, soft electronics? Yeah, the requirements are... are the same as I mentioned before, which are mechanical compliance and uh, miniaturization and electrical conductivity. So I think a big challenge is how do you make uh, uh, the integration of extremely small uh, CMOS chip now currently with extremely small pads onto the soft uh, interfaces. And then even if you manage to do this, how do you negotiate the tra mechanical transition from the rigid component to the soft component? Mm -hmm. And uh, really the, there you need to, 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 to think of uh, engineering gradients or strategy to actually distribute the stress or the strain in your structure to, the, to, to prevent uh, catastrophic failure. But um, on the pure electrical side, one key challenge is really also the interconnect and the bonding of uh, the contact pad from the chip to the, uh, to, to the soft structure. Because we, on, uh, to my knowledge, on soft uh, system, we're not able to miniaturize as much as we do on, on silicon, for example. So there's still a mismatch of a, an order of magnitude between how small you can do on soft and how small you can do on standard inorganic electronics. Okay, there is a question was the following. It's all from uh, National University of Singapore, Song Lin Zhang. Yeah, it says that usually the function components are embodied in the soft substrate, which unavoidably you know, create additional interfaces. To what extent do these interfaces impact, uh, impact the performance of the system? Is there any way we can, you know, uh, seamless, you know, integrate the multiple multiple function in one system? Yeah, that's a very good point, and I think uh, this goes back to some of the earlier question on the stability because. When you do the hybrid integration, you, inter, you, you create many interfaces and an interface is always a point of failure or a potential point of failure because you may have debonding, delamination, air pocket or leakage. Um, and indeed, uh, by doing the hybrid integration, this is a big risk of uh, introducing poten potential very specific point of failure in the system. Um, so, you know, if you could engineer everything from the built-in, a bit like uh, some of the approaches that people are doing now with um, some of these 3D printing approaches or non-contact printing um, uh, uh, techniques, uh, maybe you can find, you know, a, a more uh, uniform and homogeneous structures um, there's a, actually a lot of super interesting uh, research to be done there on the material side and how you actually can localize uh, intelligence in a way, you know, mm -hmm. manipulate the specific local property of your, of your bulk material. 
um, in order to prevent any of these interfaces and, and get a higher uh, higher integration level. So I think uh, there's a, it's probably a route to the, that needs to be further explored. Uh, it's not probably, it's sure, you have to further explore that. Um, and it's probably going to be, the solution in the end is probably going to be at the intersection of many of these approaches because there's always pros and cons. Um, at the moment, if you think purely on the electronic side, you know, there's nothing that really works as an alternative to CMOS. So if you want to do sophisticated computation onto your implant or onto your wearable, you need to have a CMOS chip somewhere. Um, and so no matter what you do, you, can, you will have to have an interface from the silicon to, to softer material. Okay, great answer. So now almost the time we give the last chance to our challenger. So Hong Zhang, yeah. You'll have a last chance to ask a question. <laughs> okay, thank you. Give me a chance. Okay, as a young as a young scientist or a junior researcher, what should we prepare if we want to translate our scientific innovation to commercial products or industrial um, product? How do we balance our time and effort? What's an uh, important factor during different periods? What's your suggestion, Professor Lacroix? Thank you. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, <laughs> uh, this is also something really. It's it's um, so if you're motivated with the uh, entrepreneurial uh, and want to really do business translation, I think this is um, something you. Uh, so you 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 must be fully convinced from the beginning. You know you need to be fully committed to that. You can't do a little bit of oh maybe I'll do a postdoc and and then then maybe I'll do also a startup. That doesn't work. So my advice is that if you want to start to do your and 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 do your business translation, this is a two hundred percent job. So you really need to um, to to focus on this. You need to. Um, to try and network, I think that's very important. Talk to people who have done or have similar experience before, maybe mm -hmm. not necessarily on your technology, of course not, but uh, it doesn't exist, but uh, talk, what, talk to people who have gone through, you know, taking innovation from the lab to the startup because uh, you will learn from, from their experience so that you don't replicate some of the, some of the mistakes. And, um, also team up with people who will bring the competencies that uh, you don't have, you know, in terms of when we, we're trained as scientists, we're not trained to do management, we're not trained to do, you know, looking for um, investors, etc. So it's important to also have very quickly someone, I think, who is on the business side, who understands the mechanism to, to, to raise funds and support the activities of, the, of your business. Mm -hmm. So it's not a it's not a solo job. You need to have a team. <laughs> yeah, yeah actually, EPFL have very good incubator. Yeah, so yeah, we have I good incubators. One of the best, uh, you know, in Europe. Well, they launching a lot of uh, you know a project from university. They have a very good collaboration. I think mm -hmm. this uh, maybe you know Hong Dao, you can take a look. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so much. <laughs> okay, Professor Leku, thank you very much. And uh, well, thank Jin, you very much. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you. Hong Zhang, thank you very much for joining this panel discussion. I think today we're really productive. Yeah, in this you know, short time, we go through a lot of questions. And uh, yeah, we have a, a lot of kind of uh, new inspirations from uh, Professor Leku's talk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Professor Leku. Yeah, yeah okay. uh, as yeah. normal, I will deliver this to you. Yeah, uh, because this was one of the, you know, certification from IKX Talks. Uh, but today, I'm uh, sorry we couldn't meet on site. I will deliver this <laughs> virtually to you. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It's a very nice <laughs> talk. Yeah. Okay, bye. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so next bye, week, bye. Yeah, bye. we're going to... Uh, we're going to have the last speaker in June as uh, Professor Yan Yi Huang. And uh, first of uh, all, next uh, Thursday, we will listen to his story. He's a very funny young professor, but he's already a superstar. So we interviewed Professor Huang, and we will have this online story to share on the uh, Thursday. And uh, then on uh, Friday, we will have a uh, Professor Huang's talk for microfluidics technology for COVID-19 detection. 
I think this was the hardest hard topic, you know, yeah, may, uh, in this year. So we really want to know, you know, how to detect that. Yan Yi already made the technology and used in the real detections and help a lot of people. So next week, Friday, yeah, we have this nice talk waiting for you. And this was I can ask talks. So see you next Friday and see you on this stage. Bye bye.